Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we just decided to be very German and start on time. So uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm happy to see so many faces. And some of you might not know that this is a little world premiere. Um, it's the first public lecture jointly organized by DED under the DED in ZEF under the umbrella of the I'll have to uh, take this mouthful, uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. It's a global organization, and in March this year, uh, we have founded a German chapter, DEA, NZEF, and uh, 10 other German civil society and research organizations. Um, and the goal of the, SD, the SD, SDSN, that's the short for the mouthful, uh, is basically to mobilize scientific and technical expertise uh, for sustainable development, find solutions and promote them. And uh, this is also basically what the German chapter tries to achieve in the context of Germany. So um, our distinguished speaker today is Professor Joshua Castellino from the School of Law at Middlesex University in London. Um, and Professor Castellino is deeply engaged in the global SDSN, both as a member of the Leadership Council and as a co-chair of the thematic group on challenges of social inclusion. And uh, Professor Castellino, thank you very much uh, for being here today. Uh, I, I only met you half an hour ago, um, but uh, we talked about internet, and uh, so I had a chance to look at some of your lectures before. And I know that you don't like that moderators set you up for failure by telling too much about what you've done in the past. So I limit myself to just a couple of key issues that you should know about him. If you want to know more, uh, Google him or corner him right after his talk here at ZEF and ask him. Um, but um, well, Professor Castellino has worked and published widely on international law, um, human rights law, self-determination, indigenous rights, and many other related topics. And uh, beyond his role in the SDSN, he's also engaged in various international initiatives on human rights advocacy. And uh, his topic for today, I believe, could not have been more timely. In fact, after announcing it, we received uh, some feedback um, that made us believe that this will be a hot discussion um, when we're done, so I'm looking forward to that one. And in that sense, I want to also thank uh, Professor anna Katharina Hornwich um, for agreeing to, to kickstart our discussion um, later this evening. Uh, Professor Hornwich is acting director of ZEF's Department on Political and Cultural Change, and she's worked extensively on the role of knowledge in development, so I believe uh, that's a topic that's fundamentally linked to uh, many, if not all, thematic areas that are being discussed uh, in the post-2015 development agenda. Um, and I want to basically leave it here and give the floor to Professor Castellino. We thought we have a 30-something 30, uh, 30 minutes talk and uh, a discussion statement afterwards, and then we open the floor for at least 45 minutes of discussion. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to, to do this lecture and thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and I'm, I'm hoping that we have a, a quite thorough discussion on some of these aspects. I'm, I'm very conscious that in a sense we are probably speaking at this from different issues and different perspectives. That I'm speaking to you very much as somebody involved in international law. I'm looking at the extent to which human rights is relevant and also in the context of trying to understand what is being done with regards to the post-2015 development agenda. As we speak, of course, we know that there's an organization that's making its way down the Tigris, which has already made its way down the Euphrates, and is capturing people and capturing towns and capturing villages. And it's not just capturing land, it's pulverizing land. It's pulverizing its opposition. And I think this is the kind of scenario that we are, we are living in, and this is the kind of scenario we need to, to, to really address if we're going to think about what any planning agenda is going to be. So my, my comments, essentially I'm going to talk about, about five different issues, and I'm, if you bear with me, I'll just tell you what they are. And judging by the fact that we have about 30 minutes, I'm going to spend about five or six minutes on each. So I want to first talk to you about the promise of human rights and the reality. I'm going to talk about what the Human Rights Project was meant to deliver and how it's failed. I want to speak to you a little bit about the danger of business as usual as we go forward. I want us to focus a little bit on the bottom billion, because I think that's where these challenges lie, and I think what's happening with Islamic State at the moment highlight that very clearly. 
I want us to think a little bit more about the future from the perspective of the disenfranchised. And I want to ask us questions about, well, here's all this analysis and all these problems, all these problems we can look at, where do the solutions come from? I have to say that I am an optimist and I do believe that we, have, we are agents of change and that we need to find the solutions from within us and we need to implement them. But to be able to do that, Nick, requires quite a significant mindset shift. And I'm hoping I'll be able to demonstrate why. Okay, so we think about the human rights agenda itself and the promise of the human rights agenda. Essentially, it's based on a fundamental notion, and that's that every individual has inherent and equal dignity and worth. That's the fundamental principle behind it. So we live in a world, or we are meant to live in a world, and we are meant to construct judicial, legal, and administrative systems that can guarantee that the rights of every individual to their inherent dignity and worth can be upheld. That's supposed to be the promise. Quite a radical promise, to be, to, be, to be honest, because it's located within law. It's located within what I often think of, along with theology, as probably the most conservative discipline. And why do I say that? You can say, well, law has always had this, this difficulty. On the one hand, law is nothing but a set of rules. On the other hand, law is a set of rules guaranteed towards creating order. And you, you think about order, and you say, well, yeah, we can create order, but what about justice? Where does justice fit into the equation? You can have unjust orders. Apartheid South Africa was ordered, but it was unjust. How do you create a just order and not just order? I think that's going to be the big challenge. And as we go forward, the, the notion of locating the human rights agenda within law was quite radical. Again, this is, we live in an era where we glorify democracy, and of course, like everybody else, I believe that democracy is, is the, the worst, worst possible governance except for every other one, which is even worse. But even in the demos, when we think about ancient Greece, women and slaves couldn't vote because women couldn't own land, and slaves were objects of law and not subjects of law. So when you look at the oldest forms of legal, legal lawmaking, if you like, law was made by the powerful, to protect the interests of the powerful. And in the context of that justice, we hope to flow from that, those order. So the challenge really of locating human rights and the justice question at the heart of the human rights project, at the heart of the United Nations in 1945 was radical. Not many people knew about it in 1948 when the Universal Declaration was passed, but that particular de document has since become the blueprint on which many administrative legal systems are based and is featured in almost every constitution. So on the one hand, human rights promise is to maintain and create a system by which the inherent dignity and worth of every individual is upheld. We call that in law, de jure equality. Every constitution in the world has it. On the other hand, you have the de facto situation, actual facts on the ground, which are anything but equal. So how is it that the human rights agenda is meant to tackle this particular issue? And that's where much of the failing lies. So initially, when we had this, the, the vision of the, of the founding fathers and mothers of this particular uh, regime, the idea was that human rights would be civil, political, economic, social, and cultural. If you're looking at the entirety of human existence, you need to worry about the fact that somebody needs to have the right to work and the right to education and the right to health as much as their right to be free from torture, as much as their right to be, have the freedom of expression. That was the theory at the start. Then there was an intervention. From 1948 to 1966, the world community fragmented again, and this, this time on the basis of East-West. You had Western countries who were driving the process of human rights forward, who argued that essentially what this was about was about creating robust mechanisms to protect civil and political rights. When you said, well, what about economic, social, and cultural rights? They said, the market will decide. Laissez-faire economics will decide. In the meantime, you had African states who said, well, you can't eat the right to vote. What's the point of having civil and political rights? We need to have socioeconomic rights. We need to ensure infrastructure, health, education, to which the counter-argument was, yeah, but we're talking about human rights that's applied by the judiciary. The judges can't decide how much money needs to be spent on education. That's the job of parliament. That's the job of legislators. So we had this clash very early on, and the result of which you had robust mechanisms for the protection of civil and political rights, but you had almost no interest in socioeconomic and cultural rights. And I think at that point, the fragmentation between the development community 
and the legal community on human rights was almost a, a, a permanent divorce because you essentially didn't have a common language anymore. People working in development weren't that interested in, in, in torture, death penalty, freedom of expression. They were interested more in socioeconomic rights. People in working in, in legal settings and human rights weren't interested in socioeconomic rights because they said, well, how do you make them justiciable? And justiciable, for those of you who are not familiar, and apologies if you are, but for those of you who are not familiar, justiciability is a concept by which you go to a court of law and the judge enforces your right. So the argument is if you are, if you are threatened with torture, you could go to a judge and the judge can prevent the torture from occurring. But if you're hungry and you go to a judge and say, I have a right to food, the judge can't enforce your right to food. That's the, the, the simple, uh, a simple explanation of justiciability. So this, this chasm grew. The other uh, reason why this chasm grew is essentially you think about how the human rights mechanism worked. So you think about, uh, uh, um, and this is almost, um, um, I guess, a, a bit of an exaggeration. But typically, human rights were gained by advocates who could fight against the state and win judgments in a court of law. Now, that's fine to a certain extent, but it assumes that people who really need access to these things have access to courts. Very often they don't. Very often the people who are, who are victims of human rights are nowhere near the legal system. They are not represented among the lawyers. They certainly have no representation among the judiciary. They don't form part of policy-making communities. But the hope is that somehow by expressing these promises in law, those who are denied the promises will somehow magically be able to command a lawyer and will take their case to court and will win it. Sorry, this, this place here if you want to. Just stand here. That's okay, that's okay. I'm happy to be interrupted at any stage. Um, so I think that, that's the issue. So the fundamental difficulty really with human rights became how do you create access for those who need it most? And this is a fundamental question because the whole idea of human rights and locating it in law was this idea that it's no longer just the powerful who can access it, but everybody. But if everybody can't access it, then, then what is the point of it? How, how does it work? You know, I, I tell my students when I work with them, look around a courtroom in a common law country. I come from India, very much a common law country, very similar to, to British institutions. When you enter a court in a common law country, people wear wigs. People have a physical bar. There's an ambience there. It's screaming you don't belong. It's screaming a conversation between the powerful. So essentially, if you are a victim, you need to find somebody who's powerful enough to make your argument to somebody who's even more powerful, who can then give you what you want. So the idea is you make a great argument and then the state throws you some scraps which you then accept as your human rights. And I, 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 this is an exaggeration, but it's a, it's a fundamental aspect for me because essentially what you then have is a mechanism by which law doesn't address the needs of the most vulnerable. And instead you have law as a means through which the powerful gain even more protection than they already had. And this was brought home to me really when I worked as a journalist in India before I... I, I embarked on what then became a legal, uh, became an academic career. But when, when you work in the slums in Bombay and you talk to them about evictions, slum evictions, and you say, but, you know, you, the police turned up yesterday and took away and demolished your slum, what do you mean? Surely you can go to the police. And they say, well, the police demol demolished it. You say, well, what about the courts? And they say, what? no, of course not. And you realize that actually the poor view law as an instrument of disenfranchisement and not as a means to gain the rights that they have. So how do you ta challenge this? How do you actually get in a position where you can speak power or speak truth to power, as, as Virginia O'Leary puts it? I think that's the major challenge. So in many ways, the human rights agenda in, in that particular context has not given us the kind of insight we need to, and not given us the kinds of tools that we need to fight this particular aspect. Now, let's park that to one side and look at the post-2015 um, um, scenario that, that most of you work on and are interested in. If we have the data that we have with regards to climate change. If we have the data that we can see with regards to inequality, this problem is going to get heightened. And we need to find a mechanism through which we can address it. If we take the human rights approach as we know it now, individual rights based, conducted through courts of law, based really on a, 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 an argument that is made by advocates to a state, we're not going to be able to address these kinds of questions. The human rights agenda has not delivered very much for people in vulnerable groups. 
it, I'm not saying it's failed because it's created some bulwark of protection, but it's not developed the kind of the kind of goods it was meant to develop. I think the challenge is going to be that. So if you imagine a world where resources are even more hotly cont contested for, you will have a scenario by which the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. You will have a scenario by which there will be people involved in production and there'll be others who are there just to consume, but to be able to consume, they need to have the resources to consume. They won't have those resources to consume. And this is a real worry. The worry that essentially the, the poor get bid out of the process and that ultimately they don't become stakeholders. And I think for me, what's happening in the Middle East at the moment with Islamic State is a classic example of that. It's tapping into an anger that people have. That anger was first expressed in the Arab Spring where people said no more, no more privileges. No more are we going to live in a world where we are told we are equal but just like animal farms, some of us are less equal than others. We want a society where we all have a stake. And this is the promise that has been made in our constitutions and we're not getting it. And that Arab Spring, meant the, the hope that flowered with it was again turning sour and it's allowed very angry people to capitalize on it and to use that mentality and tap into that anger and do it with, through, through sheer fear. And I think that's going to be a big challenge. So, Essentially, what I'm talking about is the bottom billion, and this is some, a reference that, that some of you might know to Paul Collier's work. Uh, Paul Collier in 2007, when the world still had six billion people, allegedly, um, talked about the bottom billion. Uh, we have seven now. Uh, in the context of Collier's work, he argued that actually five of the world's six billion people either live in or aspire to 21st century conditions. Okay? That's quite a high number. And the reason it's so high is because he simply lumped India and China into the 5 billion, not because India and China have people who are in 21st century conditions, but because his argument is they understand what it means to be in the 21st century conditions. They might not have it themselves, but they want it for their children. So they have an aspiration for it. So they might be stakeholders. But Collier tells us there's a bottom billion, and according to Collier, these, this bottom billion lives in sub-Saharan Africa, possibly in Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam. And Collier says these people live in 14th century feudalistic condition, by and large. The only aspect they have to modernity is 21st century weaponry. And that you can get quite easily, probably easier than a bag of rice. So the argument that Collier is making is that there's this gap is widening between the haves and the have-nots. Now, I disagree with Collier's work on, in one important aspect. I think the bottom billion live within societies. I don't think that they are out there in particular countries. You actually have at the table in your societies, including in Germany, populations that are excluded. They might be migrants. They might be, in inverted commas, illegal immigrants. They might be Muslims in some societies. How is it that you configure them really depends on your national context. But there are these people who are being excluded more and more, and they are essentially falling off the radar. And the one thing that they have when you look at these communities is they, 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 they try to engage with it. They don't succeed. And then other people within the community say, see, I told you, this is the society is not really interested in including you. And then you immediately get into the scenario by which they engage in the politics of desperation, otherwise known as terrorism. That's not a justification for it. That's an explanation of it. The idea is really that if you don't create societies that are inclusive, that make everybody believe they have an, at least an outside chance of gaining the fruits of your development, they are going to be in a society where you think I've got nothing at stake. I don't really care what happens to this building because it's not going to house me. And I think that's the argument that really has to be central to any, any kind of planning process. And I mean, in Collier's, Collier's work, he highlights the danger of this exclusion, and he looks at it in the context of various, various different um, countries and, and, and state policies. So my argument is that when you look at human rights, put away the assumptions that you have made in the past. And the reason for that is because the assumptions that you made in the past and the assumptions that we were all collectively taught were that human rights were essentially civil and political, that human rights were essentially about focusing on the individual, and that human rights were ultimately given to you through an antagonistic fight with the state by the judiciary. What I'm suggesting to you instead, that you shouldn't think about human rights as a what question anymore. Think about it as a question for whom. Because actually that's the, the emphasis of it. If what we are involved in doing in the promise of human rights is to create a mechanism by which the inherent dignity and worth of every individual is protected, then let's, let's look at those individuals. Let's look at those particular groups. What you will find if you look at them across different states is that in, at the bottom end, 
underneath the poverty line, there's a huge conglomeration of people who are very similar. They are often ethnic minorities, linguistic minorities, with women in those communities even worsely affected because they don't have access to resources or land either. You will find that they are indigenous peoples whose land has been taken away, who are told that they are no longer subjects of law, but objects of law, without beleaguering the point. This is an object. If I throw it to the ground, if I do, I'm not going to do it, but if I do any of that, I don't need the consent of this, because it's an object. But if it was a human being, it's a subject. I would need the consent. We have treated indigenous peoples as objects of law. They are essentially no different from a river or a tree. In fact, with the new environmentalism, rivers and trees possibly have more rights than indigenous peoples did. We have happily assumed that the land that indigenous peoples lived on was terra nullius. We use fancy Latin terms because that justifies it. Terra nullius, blank territory. So the argument in law, you can't take your neighbor's garden over, even though it might look nice. My neighbor's garden is much nicer than mine. But you can't take that garden over because it's very clear that that neighbor owns the property or has exclusive use to that property. But if you fool yourself into believing that that neighbor's garden is empty, terra nullius, then you can lay claim to it as the first discoverer. Australia, 200 years of case law in Australia was based on the fiction that Australia was terra nullius. It took 1992, a big decision in the Queensland High Court, to say, for a judge to say, oh, you know, I think we might have been wrong here. I think there were people, actually, who lived there. And we know this, you know, when, if you look at the original charter given by the Queen to Captain Cook, he was a real person, not just a character from a Peter Pan, but Captain Cook was told, go out to Australia, find nations and communities you can trade with and treat them equally. Captain Cook landed in Sydney Harbour Bay, looked around and thought, well, people, yes, but these are not people. So he happily laid claim to it and he planted the flag there, he planted the British flag there, as the original occupiers, as the first discoverers. By the way, he then crossed the, the Tasman Sea, went to New Zealand. When he saw those big Maoris, he decided to sign a treaty with them. He wasn't going to fight with those guys because they are, they are much, much bigger. So I, I use that to demonstrate the point that, in a sense, the way in which we've looked at indigenous peoples still is as objects of law and not subjects of law. And actually, that translates very much to the original idea of how law was constructed as essentially a mechanism by which the powerful create rules for, for their own interests. And of course, the vast majority of laws created were land rights. And that remains a big, big feature within this context. So if we are looking at a post-2015 planning process and not including these kinds of fundamental questions, we run a major risk. And the risk we run is essentially to diverge even further and to leave behind populations even further. And if all of the other elements go according to the way that they should, with regards to the climate change, with regards to the challenges we face, then this is only heightened. You could argue that many of the conflicts, and this has been argued for a while, and political scientists among you will know the work of Barry Buzan for a long time arguing that resources are going to be the big issue. But resources in conjunction with ethnic identity, with, with tensions within states, make for a, for a terrible mix. One of the other ways of looking at this is, if you look at the global map, 80% of states are post-colonial. In a vast majority of those states, the boundaries make no sense. They simply make no sense because they have been arrived at by, as a compromise between two colonial powers. I talk to my students in public international law about the Berlin-West Africa Conference, 1896. No West Africans there. Just European states, where they agreed a rule, which I talk, I, I always tell my students is like a supermarket, buy one, get five free rule where essentially if you could claim the coast, the inside is yours for free. So the distinction between Nigeria and Niger is British and French influence. It's nothing to do with the communities on the ground. Why is this relevant? This is relevant because actually within the states there are question marks about the extent to which any of those national identities make sense. If you throw in climate change and a competition for resources, you are creating the, 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 the powder, the keg, for further ethnic conflict. And this is not even new. Those of you who have been studying conflict know that this is an ongoing scenario. The Middle East plays this hypothesis out very clearly. Okay, so much for the problems. I want to spend the remaining seven minutes I have, according to my estimation, talking a little bit about the solutions because I do believe they exist. So 
essentially, when you think about this, the, 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 the solutions that exist that I feel need to be brought in, and this is one of the reasons why the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network is of interest to me. Because I think, especially as academics, we do a lot of navel-gazing and pointing out how, how broken the world is. But actually, unless we put our heads together to start looking for solutions, no matter how difficult they might be, we're not going to change the mindset. And for me, the big, the big element that I work on is this argument that to be able to test how useful any state's human rights are, check how, how accessible it is and how much it is used and how much it provides rights to the most vulnerable. If it doesn't provide rights to the most vulnerable, the Roma community, for instance, then this is a club. And you might want to belong to the club because it suits you, because you go to various clubs, and I do, at various clubs at various times. But don't fool yourself that this is a club that protects the inherent dignity and worth of every individual. So test the extent to which the remedies you have in your constitution, in your statute, in your civil code, in your criminal code, actually protect and uphold the rights of the vulnerable groups. And if it doesn't do that, ask yourself what needs to be done. Perhaps there's no problem with the law. I studied the Chinese legal system, for instance. There's very little wrong with the Chinese legal system. In terms of design, China...